It's Friday afternoon. It's time for our Better Managers Briefing. And today I'm delighted to be talking about something that affects so many of you, which is skills. Whether you're a young person or somebody in employment that will need to reskill, uh, this crisis has really thrown a light on how important they will be. And I'm delighted to welcome two guests. The first is CMI companion, Rachel Sanby Thomas. Rachel is the Registrar of Warwick University. And prior to that, actually worked in civil service in skills and on the apprenticeship levy. Uh, my second guest is Ewan Blair, and Ewan is a CMI partner. He runs White Hat, one of our leading partners, and um, one of the fastest growing startups, uh, tech startups in Europe. So welcome to both Rachel and Ewan. And again, sorry people about the technical issues. If you want to ask a question, please click the link underneath the YouTube and your question will appear on the screen. So first up, as I said, the need to reskill and upskill young people and the millions of the unemployed is a key theme coming out of this crisis. How can we best do this? And what should our objectives be? And, and what do you think some of the pitfalls will be? Maybe I'll start with you, Rachel. So maybe I will start with you, Ewan. Yeah. Don't worry, I'm happy, happy to be on this. Hopefully everyone can hear me and there aren't technical issues, this is all good. Right. Um, well, thank you. Thanks for, for having us on this. And I think it's obviously something we think a lot about at White Hat. Um, probably the, the clearest thing to say is that we'll need to be incredibly ambitious in how we approach this topic more generally, because this is a pretty unprecedented crisis. And I see broadly three objectives. I think the first is providing good options for the 700,000 or so young people leaving school this year, because we're going to need to be able to do something for them. The second is aligning those options to actually solving the real skills crisis that is facing employers that existed before, but has now become multiple times more acute as a consequence of the pandemic. And the third is just going to be ensuring that the opportunities are distributed in such a way that we don't leave anyone behind, that we're not leaving large parts of society behind, which has got to be um, incredibly front of mind at the moment. And I think that those efforts will be driven, yes, a bit by government, but employers, obviously, um, organizations like us providing apprenticeship to universities, and it's going to require more than just point solutions. And a lot of people, in fact, I imagine everyone will be familiar with the fact that Boris Johnson a couple of weeks ago announced an apprenticeship guarantee. As of yet, we have no idea what that looks like. It sounds tremendously promising, but it's crucial we get that right because we need to ensure young people in particular aren't being disproportionately impacted by the economic situation resulting from COVID. And I think ultimately the best intervention is probably going to include some form of, of wage subsidy, um, to support hiring that talent in the short term and formal structured programs like apprenticeships that are squarely focused on the emergent skills needs. So data analysis, software, management, business operations. Um, you asked about the pitfalls and I think probably leaving it too late or wasting time on schemes that sound good but don't actually provide the outcomes we need. For example, I'm not convinced it's adequate simply to pay people to do voluntary work because I'm unconvinced this will actually result in long-term careers for them. I think it's got to be really closely aligned to the needs of the labor market. And then any training has to be linked to genuine skills needs. Those are all very good points. And um, you mentioned the role the government could play. Not things should be employer-led, which I do agree with um, as well. Uh, but you did mention uh, government financing some of this. But how do you think that employers and government and the, the learners can work well together to make sure that we do deliver this and, and we don't leave people behind um, and we don't make it too complicated? What are your thoughts there? So I think where possible, you've got to look at existing mechanisms like apprenticeships that exist when it comes to, to freeing up the funds. I've been speaking recently about the fact that government announced um, this national training fund that exists and has money behind it, but hasn't yet been deployed. Um, we can clearly try and figure out how to how to allocate those resources best. It will need some form of reskilling for people at different stages in their career, people who are furloughed and people who are unemployed. 
And then it's it's really just crucial that that generation of young people emerging from the education system at the moment do not find themselves in a situation where they can't access work, they can't start building a career, and they're left permanently scarred by it. And government will need to help provide a North Star in terms of guiding direction around that. We'll need more um, better lines of communication between groups of employers, people delivering training, and individuals themselves in the education system. I think everyone is aware that for a long period of time, there's been a massive disconnect between what the education system, the formal education system is providing people with, and the things that employers need. Well, this is as, as good an excuse as any to try and really refocus again on how we get that right. It's a very good point that you're making. Um, I'm assuming we're still having trouble bringing Rachel back in. But one of the things that we found at CMI when we do surveys of the skills that employers want and need, uh, we find that communication skills, the ability to motivate others, lead a team, um, come out very um, top of the list. Do you think that we put enough emphasis on that in our uh, secondary and indeed our tertiary education system? And what do you think we need to do differently to, to do that better if we do need to do it better? Well, un unsurprisingly, I, I wholeheartedly agree that we don't do a good enough job on it. And we see the evidence of that from young people we work with leaving school who, who have high motivation, high levels of intent, are, are smart and driven, but no one's ever taught them how to have a challenging conversation, how to communicate effectively, um, how to manage your finances, for example. We, With the work and training components we provide through an apprenticeship, we also have this community that supports what we do, and we spend a lot of time with the community, yes, doing some of the social stuff that university provides, but actually teaching people and having breakout sessions and, and workshops on how to manage personal finances, how to succeed in the early stages of the workplace, how to um, manage upwards as well as downwards and lots of other things that we're sort of thrusting people into the workplace and assuming they can figure this stuff out. That's that's a big problem. It doesn't make it any easier. Um, employers have already complained that graduates are coming without the skills they need. And to be clear, there are hard technical skills and digital skills as well. I mean, the OU, I think, estimates that the, the skills gap in digital alone in this country is costing nearly five billion a year. So there are, there are sort of multiple problems that we need to solve. I think apprenticeships are the mechanism to get a lot of that right if they're suitably broad and not just narrowly confined to how someone is good at one particular job. That's all very cool. Now, I think Rachel is back with us. Um, Rachel, we were just talking about how to better embed employability skills into young people. Um, what are your thoughts on how we might be able to do that? So, well, I think, and I'm sorry if you've already um, covered this, so I was having problems with my Wi-Fi. Um, I think a lot of it depends on what you mean by employability skills. Um, I personally think that most employability skills are best learned actually in a workplace uh, with people who are going to take people entering the workplace under their wing and help them through it. Um, I know at the moment it's a, it's a kind of a big thing and there's lots of kind of, you know, lessons and training and courses. But actually, I think that a lot of them, I think, are attitudes and their behavioral uh, stuff. Um, and I, you know, so I am a big, I am a big believer in actually training people on the job. Mm -hmm. So apprenticeships then and, and degree apprenticeships and um, uh, are a good way of gaining those skills or work experience embedded into education. Yeah, I think they are. So, you know, I'm also kind of a, I'm a big fan of apprenticeships. I'm also a big fan of um, placements and kind of internships and all of those kind of things as well. Um, I mean, I think a lot of the workplace skills are actually also learned when people are uh, learning and studying. So I have noticed a big change since um, the heady days when I was at university of people actually working together, lots and lots of peering in ways that we never did when we we're early. And that's all team working, which is like a huge employability skill. I mean, mm -hmm. problem solving is another one, uh, finding patterns and things. They are all done in the course of academic studies. It's just people very rarely think about them as employability skills, but they are skills that people use in the workplace all the time. That's an excellent point. Um, when when we started, we were talking about 
uh, obviously coming out of this crisis, so many people needing to reskill and upskill and young people especially. Uh, what are your thoughts as to how we can best do that? So I think we need to be careful not to lump everybody into one homogenous pool because I think their experiences are going to be very different. So I think with young people, a lot of it will be uh, not having had much work experience um, and with the fear of unemployment now, finding it difficult to get work experience. Uh, whereas a lot of people, unfortunately, are probably going to be made redundant. So they do have work experience. So that's not what they need. Uh, they probably need retraining into kind of skills that are of the moment, which I suspect is what uh, Ewan was talking about when I rejoined. Uh, so I think one of the pitfalls is actually to differentiate potentially the two groups. Um, and then the solutions are potentially different. So, I mean, I would like there to be some kind of internship, uh, potentially backed by the government to provide incentives to business to actually take young people on internships. Um, and then, but that's kind of different somewhat from the people who are entering unemployment from jobs, where maybe this is an opportunity for them to retrain and uh, take a kind of a different path, uh, potentially helped, supported either by grants or by uh, government backed loans. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so quite similar answers. And, and actually, um, before we go to the next question, uh, Ewan made the point uh, that we should use wherever possible existing mechanisms, um, whether those are training providers such, or educational institutions like universities or uh, the, the current levy scheme, um, and, and try and resist the temptation to throw it all up in the air and start a completely new system. Do you, do you agree with that? Absolutely, totally and utterly wholeheartedly agreed with that. Absolutely. Because otherwise it just wastes time because you've got the whole organizational stuff. It'll be it'll be years. They'll be unemployed for two years and what that's going to do to their morale and what that's going to do to the economy is terrible. So yeah, we should absolutely be using existing institutions. Um I mean I think there there may be I mean we're probably coming on to kind of uh, further discussions about what the role of training providers and government and everything is. I mean, one of the things I think is quite urgent is to try and get people together to work out what the skills gap are, because it would be criminal in a way to waste this opportunity to make sure that we're upskilling people in the right way and a future looking way rather than a past looking way. Um, and I think that needs to be done as a matter of urgency. Okay. And I was just going to say, if I could just add on to that, the, the only thing the only thing I'd make a distinction between is existing differentiating between existing mechanisms and existing institutions. I actually think part of the problem is that we have a lot of institutions that organizationally aren't really fit for purpose. And some of that's been proven through the response to COVID. I think we and it should be no surprise saying this as as, as someone who runs a, a fast, high growing startup. Um, that we need more organizations that are being created and entering these fields to drive innovation and share new ideas and actually demonstrate different ways of solving these problems. But the, the, the way of encouraging that isn't to kind of completely scrap the mechanisms, it's to build on them and ensure that there are sensible entry points for organizations that are doing genuinely innovative things to enter those systems. And um, actually, this goes well um, very nicely into my third question, which is um, many of us have experienced seismic shifts in workplace culture and how we deliver learning. So, for example, um, we're doing this remotely, despite the initial uh, problems that we had. Um, and uh, all of us have had to do that in many cases overnight, as have learning providers. So universities going virtual over a weekend. Um, so how do you think educators and institutions need to adapt coming out of this crisis? Uh, what do you think will remain in place long term and what do you think will bounce back to the way it was? Maybe mm. start with Rachel. On uh, so, so I think that, um, I mean, it was amazing the speed uh, uh, with which uh, organizations adapted. Probably, you know, two years of a form over a weekend, as you say. And there's bits of it that we absolutely, sh you know, we should retain. So, for example, we went on to online exams. I mean, we've been talking about it for years, but now we know how to do it. And actually it worked. Uh, online assessment, uh, did it talk about it for years. It worked. Those kind of things we should definitely retain. Um, I think that we will go back to a more blended type of learning than we've had before. I don't think we want to throw away the face-to-face -face 
especially for us because we are a campus university uh, and actually that kind of feeling of a community and the buzz of being on the campus is really important for the student experience and also actually for the staff experience. Um, so I think it'll be a bit of both um, going forward. Um, there's certain meetings to my mind work much, much better uh, online. Uh, they're quicker. People contribute who never contributed before. They're cheaper and they're greener. So why would we not continue with that? Uh, but there are other bits, you know, you miss like the kind of water cooler intelligence or even the water cooler bits of humour, which sends you reinvigorated back into your office. Um, so I think it's going to be a mix. I hope it is anyway. And, and Ewan, what do you think? What, what, what do we keep and uh, what, what, what will go back to the way it was? And, and I, I broadly agree with Rachel. I, I think they're quite, I think actually very few things will snap back in certain areas, particularly in, in skills, for example, because in the kind of the, the skills, education, employment piece, COVID's been an accelerant rather than a kind of temporary blip. Um, you know, we will often talk about when we talked about this pre-COVID, university as a one size fits all model wasn't working. The idea you do a, a single shot of learning at the start of your career that sees you through what could be 50 or 60 years, and that's adequate, clearly doesn't work. There were issues around social mobility, issues around kind of the, the dissonance between what's being taught and what people actually need to succeed in the workplace. And I think it, it, it will have a few consequences. I think for, for higher education specifically, the value prop of that model is being questioned more seriously than it has been in decades. And that creates space for alternatives. So we will see new things emerge. Um, for example, schools are gonna be asked increasingly to look at other outcomes when evaluating their performance than simply how many of their students attend university. Workplace culture is really going to change. Um, it, it won't be a surprise to people, but many employees will not feel comfortable returning to the office in the short, an even medium term, and there'll be some that don't ever want to return. So every business is gonna to need to adjust. One of the things about this crisis is because everybody's had to go remote, um, there's, there's remarkably little friction in some of the ways of doing things because broadly people accept the role in the same circumstances. When you return to a model where some people are in, some people are out, and there's a hybrid, you're gonna to have to make adjustments. So every business will need to adopt a remote first approach to how they run meetings, um, their stand-ups, various activities. You'll need to have Zoom probably in the background in most workplaces and most meetings in order to accommodate that. So th there'll be a whole host of changes. I think some of them will be macro related to how people view what options suit them best and, and how the whole skills and employment piece works. And then lots of them will be really practical in the workplace. And it will shape how this generation and Gen Z in particular view work and view what they expect from employers. Well, indeed, you've touched on a lot there. And we know from our own CMI surveys that generally people uh, are happier working uh, remotely or most want blended working. They don't want to go back into an office all the time. And you've both mentioned that. Um, and we're going to come on to how that workplace is changing before we go open to, to open questions. But uh, what advice um, would you give to school leavers? Um, let's take those two groups to school leavers um, and to those furloughed um, in terms of what they can do to better their prospects in this current crisis. Rachel, what do you think? So I would say um, three things to them. Uh, firstly, I would say you have shown remarkable resilience and tenacity during this crisis, which you are in danger of not recognizing and therefore uh, not building your confidence on that knowledge. Uh, secondly, I would say, albeit uncertainty creates fear, it also creates opportunity. So this is a time of great opportunity to seize it. And thirdly, I would say, use your networks. I mean, I think this crisis has shown us how willing people are to help each other. So continue to use your networks to get help. And those on furlough or the unemployed, same, similar same. advice to graduates? Exactly. Same. Ewan, what, what's your advice? So I, I, for school leavers, and by the way, I thought I thought Rachel, I wholeheartedly agree with a, a lot of what Rachel said there. I think the, the main thing I'd emphasize particularly now is just give real consideration to what it is that you want to do. Um, and particular through a university lens, going to university just because it feels like a rite of passage rather than something you're actually excited about or you think will be useful isn't the right thing in normal times and certainly isn't right now. And we meet lots of people 
young people who are leaving school and don't get excited at the idea of a largely online academic learning experience. Um, and they're, they're looking for alternatives. Those alternatives exist through an apprenticeship. For example, they can get a job at a top employer. They'll benefit from applied learning, teaching them how to problem solve. They get one-on-one -on -one coaching. They earn money. They're not taking on debt. They can still get that social experience for a community. So I just think more than ever, um, question what it is that is in your best interest and make a really clear-headed decision. Because in times like this, it's incumbent on everyone to be doing that, but particularly those at the start of their careers. And I think for those who are furloughed or unemployed, um, there, there are lots of ways you can demonstrate to future employers uh, things that you, you've done, acquiring new skills, free online courses, undertaking voluntary work, supporting your community. The, the good news is actually there are signs of optimism. So I don't know if you saw earlier in the week, REC actually, for the first time since the COVID crisis, the Recruitment and Employment Confederation, found um, that more companies are planning on growing headcount than shrinking it. So we're starting to see those green shoots and companies are beginning to hire again. And actually, there are an increasing number who are bringing employees back from further. Great. So cause, cause, cautious cause for optimism from both of you. Um, I'm going to turn to the uh, questions from the audience because we did have that technical hitch, which gave us a late start. My first question is from Erica and she's asking, do you see any danger of an esteem gap arising in the workplace between those being trained in the skills needed tomorrow and those not? And if this is arising, how can managers make a positive difference? So maybe you and you'd start us off on that one. So is is the question basically asking that is there going to be a disconnect between skills indirectly taught versus skills formally taught? So I think what they're asking is what about those that are in roles where they're not going to get trained versus those that are getting trained? So um, she's asking about that. Is, go is there going to be an esteem gap between those not getting any training and those who are going to benefit from the training? I, I think I think that will that probably will exist. And the part of the culture change we need to see come out of this is employers feeling very, very comfortable uh, and in fact, actually advancing this lifelong learning agenda so that everybody needs to be doing some form of formal learning at various stages of their career. Because as I mentioned, that shot of learning piece was already obsolete. Now it just looks a, a bit ridiculous. People are going to need to keep training and retraining for what comes around the corner. And employees who aren't being given access to those opportunities, those who can will move, and those who can't will get increasingly frustrated. And I think doing that through formal programs and allowing people to get an actual credential is important because they need to be portable. They need to not just be a device to kind of keep you in your current role and good at that. People want flexibility. And when they look at the labor market, it's important we encourage that. So I agree, that's absolutely a risk. I think employers will not be able to get away with not taking learning and development seriously. So this would be a great outcome and very different to the outcome coming out of the 2008 financial crisis. My next question, I'm going to direct this one to you first, Rachel, is from Toby. All throughout my time at university and secondary school, a lot of these soft skills are indirectly taught through projects and group work, as, as you said. Do you think to have an impact fully, these skills need to be taught directly or should it come naturally as it usually does in the workplace? Yeah, so I uh, so I completely agree with you. I, I'm not a huge fan of teaching them directly because again, um, unless you do it in such a way that there's lots and lots of practice as well uh, involved in that. I think the key is to, and it applies to everybody, even in the workplace where you are working, is to actually recognize what it is you're doing. Because, you know, even for us who've been in the workplace for a long time, very often don't recognize the skills that you're actually just using naturally. Um, and it quite often helps if you have a kind of a, a friend or a friendly colleague who will actually point those out to you. So I think helping people recognize what it is that they're doing and also then potentially recognizing where they have gaps, which they need to do something to bridge is the way to do it. So we uh, at CMI obviously do believe you can learn management and leadership, but um, self-reflection, self-awareness and self-confidence form the foundation of your ability to do that. So being aware of what you're doing and reinforcing that is is, is very much more important than perhaps just reading uh, theoretical text. 
Um, do you have anything to add to that, Ewan? I, I, I mean, completely agree with Rachel in terms of these are these are great examples of things that you you can't really and shouldn't learn in a classroom vacuum. Right. Just just kind of teaching someone the without real context isn't necessarily very valuable. By the same token, you can't just rely on people to pick this up through osmosis or hope, uh, you know, a friendly colleague will show them something. So you've got to make sure there are formal structures to provide that. It's just it's not something that can be taught purely theoretically in a classroom. Absolutely. Yes. Um, and if you're not taught, you end up being an accidental manager, which um, we know there are millions of those. Um, so the next question is from Jamie. How do you think universities can adapt to focus on more than just the academic content and um, uh, and add more skills for employers? So there you go. That's a great question. Um, uh, Rachel, your thoughts? Yeah, so I kind of, you know, it's one of those really, really wide questions. Um, so there is kind of a fairly wide range of answers. Uh, so depending on the discipline kind of depends uh, on how those things are taught. So some things lend themselves much to employer's skills and anything to do with the sciences or kind of uh, engineering all immediately spring to mind as much more uh, kind of uh, employer focused or employer relevant. Whereas very few people see that something doing something like history is actually that employer focused. Um, but if we go back to right, what we were talking about right at the beginning, actually studying history does lots of stuff in problem solving, analysis, um, all of that kind of creative thinking. There's lots of employ there's skills which are relevant to employers, but not potentially relevant knowledge wise to the job in hand. So I think there is a danger when we talk that we actually model up all the time skills, knowledge and attitudes. And when I used to be director general for skills, I used to go around and talk to businesses all the time who always talked to me about their skills gap. And when I tried to get them to clarify what the skills gap was, most of the time, what they were talking about was attitude and behaviours. Um, so I think we often kind of can get dis detracted or distracted from talking about what it is employers actually want. Ewan, what are, what are your thoughts on that question? Yeah, it's it's a I mean, the, the, there's a piece in here about what is the purpose of university and what what are you trying to achieve with it? And I, I don't think it makes sense for universities just to become um, institutions that teach skills and focus on skills. It's it's not it's not actually core to their skill set, the way those institutions have been established. And there is absolutely a place for academic learning and the academic experience. There are lots of interesting questions that come from, for example, who pays for it? So you can argue that individuals should be paying for university because they're doing something that is focused on an area they want to study that doesn't necessarily benefit the wider economy in a direct way. Whereas on an apprenticeship, the employer's paying for it because it actually gives them skills that they need and, and, and require. And there will always be a distinction between what the two teach. I mean, in terms of the ethos we have at White Hat, it is essential you do not boil your training down to just how you do your job well functionally. You have to teach broader things. You have to teach people about um, the role society plays, about citizenship, about conversations, about relationships. And it all has to be blended into this whole. We talk about what we're doing when we describe apprenticeships as building an outstanding alternative to university. Well, if you're going to give, build an alternative to university, focus too on some of the things university gets really right. Absolutely. And in doing so, I think we did ask, there was another question about, is there the danger by over-focusing on STEM, we're creating a, a too narrow a focus with this approach? I think you both in your answers said that it needs to be broader than that. So uh, thank you to the person that asked that question, but I think you both answered it. So the last question here comes from Michelle, and she's saying, we arguably have skills crisis facing us after years of underfunding of schools and colleges, and now the threat of mass unemployment. What would you urge policymakers to focus on as the top priority to address this? So kind of what we were asking at the beginning, but your final thoughts, your message to the policymakers, who wants to go first? You and I'm going to let you go first since no one volunteered. <laughs> Ra I think Rachel's talking. Oh, Rachel was talking. Sorry. Was Sorry. Muted. Yeah. Sorry for the tech issues, everybody, on this version. We've not had this before. Rachel, sorry. Go ahead. 
another way. I mean, I think it's absolutely true what they're saying about underfunding, especially in the uh, FE colleges. And they have just cut way too far. So they need to put more money back into FE colleges and schools. Um, and they need to give them sufficient money, not just to survive, but order to be able to invest. Because one of the dangers of the present crises is that we need forward looking skills. But I am not sure that a lot of FE colleges who are basically fighting survival have enough bandwidth, both financially and uh, operationally, to actually provide those skills. And I think it's key that they do and that they are reinvigorated and able in some ways to reinvent themselves so they can do that, as well as lots of the really excellent work they do, uh, helping kind of younger people and people who've been failed by school to actually develop their potential. Great. And and Ewan, what are your thoughts on that question? I think for policymakers, there are there are a couple of things they can really look at. I think one of them, when they look at kind of how you indicate success around this, one of them is learning from some of the mistakes that were made post 2008 and, and mm -hmm. the legacy of cuts and other things that came as we focused too much on trying to reduce debt instead of actually looking at, at solving some of the serious problems that existed and needed more investment. And that, I think, should be at the forefront of their minds. I think the other thing is, particularly when, let's say, the government hasn't necessarily been lauded internationally for its response to the pandemic, let's at least make sure it can be lauded internationally for the response to what comes after the pandemic and the economic crisis. Wouldn't it be great if people around the world look at what the UK is doing and respect the boldness of our economic response? And skills has to be at the heart of that. So what a great thought to end this broadcast on. Thank you, Ewan. Thank you, Rachel. Apologies to everybody for the technical issues and thanks for sticking with us. So let's go forth and build a bolder, better skilled Britain. <laughs> Thank you and see you next week.